We are told that Rishi Sunak is holding a full cabinet meeting as we go to air as the UK and the United States prepare to launch military strikes against the Houthi rebels in Yemen. Grant Shapps, the Defence Secretary, suggested just yesterday that military action was imminent, just hours after US and UK destroyers in the Red Sea shot down a barrage of drones and missiles that were launched by the Iran-backed group. The government held a COBRA emergency meeting this morning, along with a meeting of the National Security Council. In Washington, the national security spokesman there, John Kirby, said it cannot be allowed to continue. Are there any red lines or steps that the U.S. would not take or would not be a part of that you could outline? No. Do those red lines exist or you just wouldn't outline I, I, them? I just don't think it's helpful, MJ, from the podium here to talk about or speculate about any potential future military options one way or another that the commander in chief is weighing or has weighed. Um, we take seriously the responsibility to protect our ships and our sailors at sea, uh, as well as the responsibility to protect the flow of international commerce. You talked to Leo Brennard here about how important that waterway is. It is. It's vital. Um, and we take those responsibilities seriously. I would add that we're not the only one. Other nations are joining us in that effort. Some 20 plus nations now are involved in the Operation Prosperity Guardian. These attacks need to stop. Uh, and we're going to do what we have to do to continue to protect that shipping, to protect our our sailors. Two governments have accused Iran of being heavily behind these attacks by providing the eyes and the ears for the Houthi missions. Today, 50 nautical miles off Amman, Iran seized an oil tanker. Armed intruders boarded the ship, the St. Nicholas, reportedly wearing military-style uniforms and black masks. Two different areas of action, 2,000 kilometres apart, but of course tightly connected. The first job, it seems, is to deal with the Houthis. The former First Sea Lord and Chief of the Naval Staff, Admiral Lord West, told the BBC all options will be on the table. Um, my advice now would be, having made a warning, and I'm not, I haven't seen exactly how that warning was made and to who, that if they continue attacks, there will be a response, is that there should be a response, and it should be very heavy and, and focused, um, because there's nothing worse than threatening someone with things and then not doing it. It just becomes worse and worse. Um, and we can't allow um, the, uh, the Houthis to just continue messing with shipping, uh, some 14% of the world's shipping going, that used to go up and down the Red Sea, uh, with no response right. to it. We're going to get reaction from our political editor, Chris Mason, who is with us at Westminster. But let's start with our security cons correspondent, Frank Garner, who's here in the studio. Um, as Admiral Lord West has just said they've been warning the Houthis for several week, weeks now. In, in terms of the strategy and the planning, Frank, what will they have been weighing up? Right. So this is a heck of a dilemma for the West here because they're damned if they do and damned if they don't. If they don't do anything, um, because all these warnings were meant to scare the Houthis into stopping their attacks, that hasn't worked. So if they don't do anything, then the West looks weak. What is the point in having a great big US-led armada down in the Red Sea with guided missile destroyers and an aircraft carrier if it doesn't do anything. But if they do hit the Houthi positions, which I think is imminent, frankly, then um, there is the risk that this will be portrayed throughout the Middle East as the US and Britain and their allies joining in the Gaza war on Israel's side. And it will be portrayed as such. People will die, almost certainly, and they will be called martyrs. It will play very well domestically at home. The risk for governments in the region is that this could generate popular unrest and it could ignite and metastasize the entire Middle East tension into something much bigger than it was. That's why they've been hesitating up until now. Can we talk about the, 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 the Arabic countries, the Arab countries, how they will view this? Um, Secretary Blinken's been in Cairo today. Rishi Sunak, as I understand, held a call with the, the Egyptian president, El Sisi. Mm -hmm. They're crucial, of course, because the ships yeah. go through um, the Suez Canal. What will the Egyptians make of it, first of all? Right. Well, most of the Arab countries in the region, the governments, can't stand the Houthis. Um, Saudi Arabia, which is the big neighbour to the north, has spent seven years fighting a war inconclusively against them. The Houthis illegally took over Yemen, or most of Yemen, um, in 2014, backed by Iran. They've since supplied themselves with some pretty powerful weaponry, missiles, drones, anti-ship ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, which are now threatening shipping. That's why we're having this conversation, because they have punched way above and beyond the borders of their country, which is the poorest Arab nation, but they're being supported and supplied by Iran, 
and they are positioning themselves as champions of the Palestinian cause, which is playing very well at home domestically and across the Middle mm. East, which is why this is so dangerous mm. for the West. They're not a state actor, the Houthis, but they're no mugs. They've been taking on Saudi Arabia for, for several years now. Uh, so what sort of things will, would the alliance be focusing on? Right. Well, you talk about the targeting, but that will be drawn up by CENTCOM, Central Command, um, the part of the Department of U.S. Defense that deals with the Middle East. So at their headquarters in Tampa, Florida, they will have drawn up a number of multiple target sets, ranging from ones with minimum casualties. But to, and I think it's most likely that if a strike goes in, it will be very limited. It will, they'll be looking to do the minimum amount of, of damage in terms of human casualties. They'll be looking to destroy boats, weapon supplies, missiles, spare parts, warehouses, that kind of thing. If the Houthis persist in their attacks, then I would expect them to move on to command and control centers uh, and something bigger. Mm. Um, so there will be a calculated, graded response. Just a final word on Iran um, in respect of the, the ships that, that's been taken today. Um, I understand that it'd been, this ship had been the subject of a, a sort of sanctions enforcement operation. So was this, which the US had led, so was this a tit for tat operation? It was exactly that, yes. So this ship, which was carrying 145,000 uh, tonnes of um, fuel oil from Basra, uh, crude oil rather, from Basra in Iraq on its way to Turkey, the same ship was impounded last year by the U.S., carrying nearly a million barrels of oil because the U.S. accused um, the ship and Iran of smuggling oil to China and against sanctions. And so this is a tit for tat by Iran. They say it's a judicial um, decision. I don't think the U.S. is going to want to deal with this right now. The Fifth Fleet didn't react to this. The ship is currently in an Iranian port called Bandar Ejask. The crew were Filipino and one Greek. I think that they parked that problem. Right now, the immediate problem is the Houthis in the Red Sea, which is driving up commodity prices, forcing ships to travel all the way around the far side of Africa, putting 10 days onto the trip, mm. adding $2 million each time. So they've got to deal with it one way or the other if the Houthis won't back down. That brings us to the politics. Frank Gardner, thank you very much indeed for that. Let's bring in then our political editor, Chris Mason, who's been patiently waiting for us. Thank you for that, Chris. Um, what are you hearing tonight about the plans that are being set out? So let me talk you through, Christian, what we know in, in factual terms and that are what, what I think it is reasonable to deduce from what we know factually. So my understanding is that around about now, in fact, in the last 20 minutes or so, uh, the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, held a conference call uh, for his cabinet and there was a briefing there relating to the prospect, the imminent prospect of the UK being involved in a military response, military, military strikes uh, against the Houthis. What's happening right now and has been happening in just the last couple of minutes as uh, we were listening to Frank there is that other senior parliamentarians are being called in to government to be briefed. The Speaker of the House of Commons, Sir Lindsay Hoyle, uh, my understanding also is that Sir Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, and John Healy, the Shadow Defence Secretary, are also being called in. So what can we read into this? Uh, we can read into this that it is convention and it is entirely within the prerogative of the British government to, uh, in, uh, to embark upon military action that it, that it deems to be necessary and should happen imminently without consulting Parliament. But it has become convention to often do that. In, in what we're seeing this evening, it would appear, is a desire on the uh, UK government's part, and here I am extrapolating a little bit on the basis of the facts as we know them, uh, that they want to brief the Leader of the Opposition, they want to brief the Speaker of the House of Commons in lieu of being able to do anything more substantive uh, with Parliament prior to what looks like the prospect of some sort of imminent strike. As I say, you heard my assembly of the facts there, and then from from that uh, an extension into where we might be heading on the basis of the choreography we're seeing playing out at Westminster in the last hour. Frank touched on the the problem that is there for commercial shipping. They're going around the Cape of Good Hope. It puts an extra, uh, I think, 12, 14 days on the trip. It's more expensive for insurance. Uh, and the governor of the Bank of England yesterday mentioned that 
possibly it could cause a new inflationary shock to our economies just at the very time that the Prime Minister is starting to point to inflation coming down. Yeah, so I think the, the, the bigger picture here in, in a UK context is one where we've seen uh, first the pandemic, uh, then the war in Ukraine, uh, then the Israel-Gaza conflict, and then the prospect, the fear of an escalation into a wider uh, regional conflict. We've already seen the uh, concerns and the pressures on commercial uh, shipping uh, in the Red Sea, which has seen a good number uh, of uh, shipping operators divert via a much more circuitous route as you were uh, referring to there and the and the concern expressed by the governor of the Bank of England and others that were things to escalate uh, in the Red Sea were we to see uh, far more shipping uh, in having to go all the way around uh, Africa uh, then that would obviously be a concern what knock-on consequence could there be and again we're extrapolating a little here but I think it's an unreasonable extrapolation around the uh, potential around oil prices for instance there is clearly concern about the ramifications that this could have but let's return to the the here and now christian and and what we know because here's another thing that we know you were touching on it a few moments ago with frank the defense secretary grant shapps just yesterday was talking about when asked about the potential prospect of imminent western uh, military strikes on uh, houthi targets to quote watch this space uh, which implied the prospect that something might be relatively imminent politicians particularly defense secretaries are schooled in being very careful in what they utter out loud and in ducking questions that they would rather not engage with mm. mr shapps did engage with that mm. uh, and said out loud what was at least a potential relatively imminent prospect and tonight there is the beginnings of evidence that the imminence of that is uh, has been fast forwarded and could come very soon just just quickly in terms of protocol chris obviously um the US is the bigger power here. They will lead. The Pentagon will take the decisions. But there is a slight fly in the ointment, and that is that the Secretary of Defence, Lloyd Austin, has been out of the picture. He's being treated for prostate cancer in Walter Reed Hospital uh, in Washington. Is there any suggestion that actually, given that we've been talking about this for several days now, that that might have held things up? Has it, has it held up the discussions between the two countries? There's every prospect it could have contributed to it. What I'm struck by right now as we're talking is that uh, what we are seeing and the noises I'm hearing out of uh, from sources here in Westminster uh, um, appear to be at this stage more advanced than the equivalent in Washington. Now, the conversation will be very live between London and Washington. Of course it will in this kind of situation. But as things stand, quarter past eight in the evening UK time, uh, the uh, emerging picture from here, the emerging choreography such as we can see it, uh, suggests that the UK is that bit further advanced. Uh, speaking to colleagues in Washington, that seems to uh, match with their interpretation of what they are seeing uh, there. Let's see how the coming hours uh, play out. And crucially, what we hear from some of those opposition voices and others as they emerge from their meeting and indeed from other government sources once the uh, cabinet meeting is concluded, which it would appear uh, it has, uh, to see what might happen uh, and when. But meetings like this, let's be absolutely clear, meetings like this, emergency cabinet conference calls following followed by the summoning of senior opposition leaders and the speaker of the house of commons happen very very rarely indeed and are usually prior to the expectation that the government might be willing to take military action relatively soon that doesn't mean it will but it means that it is it usually in scenarios like this expected to pretty soon